Welcome to this presentation on traumatic grief and existentialist perspective. Basically, I'm going to give an overview of how existentialist philosophy can cast significant light on the challenges involved in traumatic grief. I want to start off by looking at the idea of grief itself. Now, in my Grief and Its Challenges book, I make the point that grief challenges our coping resources. It makes demands on our ability to cope, whereas crisis overwhelms our coping resources. The definition of a crisis is it's a turning point in our life, that things cannot stay the same. They will either get better or they will get worse. If they're going to stay the same, then by definition it's not a crisis. So grief is not necessarily a crisis, but it can be a crisis. It can reach the point where it overwhelms our coping resources rather than just challenges them. And so that's important to understand as a crisis, a turning point in our life. Our coping resources are overwhelmed. But trauma is where something happens that devastates our coping resources. That they're not just challenged, they're not just overwhelmed, they're actually devastated. That we can feel that we just don't know who we are anymore. Well, our life has been turned upside down. And so that's what I want to focus on uh, now, is the significance of the type of loss we experience, which is so strong, has such an effect on us, that it doesn't just challenge our coping or overwhelm our coping, it actually develop, devastates our coping resources. So what light can existentialism throw on the challenges involved in traumatic grief? Now, one way of looking at existentialism is to define it as phenomenological ontology. Now, that's quite a jargonistic mouthful, but it's actually very important to understand. Phenomenology is the study of perception and ontology is the study of being. So basically, phenomenological ontology is talking about how the way we experience life, the way we experience existence, that's the ontology bit, will depend very much on perception. Because phenomenology, as the study of perception, comes down to the root word of phenomenon. A phenomenon is that which is perceived. So in that sense, phenomenology is the study of perception. It's the study of how we construct meanings, for example, in terms of how we adopt a particular perspective on the world. And then ontology is important because it relates to how we experience our existence. So let's look at each of these in a little bit more detail. Starting with ontology, which as I've already said, is the study of being. Now I want to look at a couple of points in particular here about the significance of ontology. First of all, flux and fluidity, and then I'll move on to look at temporal ecstasies. Let's start with flux and fluidity. The idea of um, this is that um, our world is constantly changing, that things are happening all the time. And although we tend to uh, see things as being relatively stable, that can often blind us to the fact that things are constantly moving, constantly changing. Another way of putting this is that existence is dynamic. Existence is about movement and change. And so one thing that we can uh, learn from this is that if we're looking at being, we're looking at existence, we have to do so through the lens of recognizing constant change and development. That where there is stability, it's because things are happening to make it stable. There are things that are, in a sense, counterbalancing the normal state, state of flux and fluidity. And looking at what those things are that create that stability can be an important part of understanding human existence. Now, linked to that is this idea of temporal ecstasies. Now, ecstasis is the Greek word for standing outside of. And what temporal ecstasis refers to is basically 
past, present and future. They are the ways in which we relate to the world, in a sense, in a, in a temporal way. And uh, this links in with the um, existentialist idea of the progressive-regressive method, as it's come to be known. Um, what that means is that if we want to understand human experience, human existence, we need to do so not just in terms of flux and fluidity, this dynamic changing nature of existence, but also how that fits in with the way time operates in terms of past, present and future. And what the progressive regressive method means basically is if we want to understand the, the present, then we have to look towards the future. That's the progressive element. We have to look at aspirations, ambitions, hopes, wishes, intentions, and so on, which will shape the present. So where we're trying to get to, the future dimension, will shape the present situation. But then also there is the past to consider, that it isn't just about the present being shaped by the future, the present is also in part shaped by the past. And so that's the regressive element of looking back because what's happened in the past will influence the present. It won't determine the present in any sort of fixed, rigid way, but it will have shaped in a variety of ways current experiences, the way life, the way existence is currently being experienced in the present. So the idea of the progressive-regressive method then is to understand the present, you have to look to the future in terms of what future issues are shaping current experience and also the past, what past experiences are shaping the future as well. And what's particularly significant there is that this fits in with the flux and fluidity, the dynamic, what could also be called a dialectical um, approach of looking at things that moving, interacting all the time, to recognise that these three different temporal elements or temporal ecstasies, to use the technical term, these interact. So what we are hoping for in the future may owe a lot to what's happened in the past. But the way we interpret the past, the way we make sense of it, sustain a narrative, if you like, of the past, will also be influenced by the future. For example, if I were to apply for a job, then I would want to um, emphasise those elements from my past experience that are relevant to that particular job. So I'm interpreting my past, my previous work experience, in light of the future, a job application. And then, of course, both of those will influence the present. So it's important to understand being, to understand existence, as this constant interaction, this flowing of the influences of these different temporal dimensions and how they um, affect us. So that's what ontology is about. And in terms of traumatic grief, this is very significant because, of course, when we experience something very traumatic, it turns our world upside down and it can, in a sense, throw out this whole idea of the progressive-regressive method that our um, future can seem meaningless because of the traumatic experience we've just had. It can be, then be difficult to make sense of our past because of the traumatic experience that we've had, because of a major significant loss or set of losses or series of losses that add up to a traumatic grief reaction, what we end up with then is a very difficult situation in which our world has, as I've already said, been turned upside down. But it's not just our world that's turned upside down, it's our whole timeline, if you like, that is turned upside down. We find it difficult to sustain this sense of movement from past to present to future when all that um, we've relied on in terms of what we've taken for granted, our sense of stability, has suddenly gone because of a traumatic loss.
So that's the ontology element of existentialism. And as I've already said, phenomenology is the study of perception. And I want to look at three particular aspects of this. First of all is the idea of individual perspectives. What we have to recognise is that when it comes to perception, when it comes to having a perspective on the world, then each of us is a unique individual. So how I see the world may be very different from the way you see the world and how you see the world may be very different from the person next to you and how they see the world. And this is a fundamental element of phenomenology is to recognize the uniqueness in many ways of people's perception of their perspectives and therefore the meanings that are developed from those perspectives, the narratives that develop from our individual unique perspectives on life. But what's also important to recognize is that it's not just about individual perspectives, that each of us is a unique individual with our own unique perspective, but we're also part of wider cultural groups, that we don't exist in a vacuum, we don't operate in a purely individualistic way, that um, we're, what we have to recognize is that we are part of a wider society of cultural formations, if you like. So our individual perspectives remain individual and unique, but we have to recognize that those individual perspectives will have been uh, uh, established, they will have been achieved through cultural lenses. So the way each individual sees the world may well be unique, but there will be much that we have in common because of the shared meanings that are part and parcel of culture, the taken for granted assumptions, the sort of unwritten rules that are part of cultures. And when I'm talking about cultures, these can be national cultures, they can be ethnic cultures, they can be organizational cultures. There's a whole range of um, levels, if you like, of cultural formation that can each have a bearing on how we develop our individual perspectives. But I do want to emphasize that while the cultural lenses are really important, it doesn't alter the fact that um, we still have those unique perspectives because people with very similar, almost identical cultural backgrounds won't necessarily see the world in the same way. It's likely that there'll be individual differences in that. Now, to take it a step further, we also have to recognize that those cultural lenses are not just random sets of habits and taken for granted assumptions. They are part of wider frameworks of meaning, what are often referred to as discourses. Now, literally, a discourse is a conversation. But in this technical sense, it's been used to refer to how a set of meanings um, uh, creates a, a set of assumptions, a set of power relationships, a set of expectations, and so on. So it's important to understand that individual perspectives will be part of a wider cultural formation or set of cultural formation formations, which are then in themselves frameworks of meaning. And although I don't want to get into it now um, in too much detail, um, because we've got enough to cover, um, those are then linked to the wider structure of society. But these discourses or frameworks of meaning are very important in shaping our perception. So what's this got to do with traumatic grief? Well, let's look at each of these, at least briefly, to think about that. What we have to recognise is that in terms of individual perspectives, that two people going through the same traumatic experience may interpret it in very different ways, may respond to it in very different ways, and therefore be affected by it in very different ways. So it's important not to overgeneralize about trauma and assume that individuals will all respond in the same way to the same traumatic experience. You're likely to find significant differences because of these individual perspectives. Then secondly, in terms of the cultural lenses, what we have to recognize is there are very distinct cultural lenses in terms of traumatic grief. So that how people respond to grief in general has its roots in 
different cultures. It's now well established that different cultures have different approaches to loss and grief. Different rituals, for example, different sets of expectations, different ways of relating to people who are grieving. And of course, all that will apply just as much to traumatic grief as it does to grief in its wider sense. But then what we can also see is that in terms of discourses and frameworks of meaning, there will be established, if you like, frameworks of meaning, established narratives that are not just about individuals, but they're actually rooted in the way societies work, which will have a bearing on traumatic grief. So, for example, one discourse around trauma is a medical one to see it as a sort of mental illness that can be dealt with like any other illness, where there can be a diagnosis based on certain um, symptoms. There can be a prognosis, which is linked to uh, treatment modalities and, and so on. And all that terminology around uh, trauma is very well established. It's very common, but it is actually just one way of understanding trauma. It is a particular way of creating a framework of meaning around traumatic grief is to see it as, in a sense, an illness, to see it as something that requires a medical approach. And uh, an existentialist perspective would challenge that, would want to say, is it actually helpful to define somebody who is experiencing traumatic grief as ill with all that that entails. So that is a really important point to uh, bear in mind. So we've looked at the idea of existentialism as being basically about ontology and in particular a phenomenological perspective on ontology. And we've started to see it's quite complex, but it also has significant implications in terms of how we understand traumatic grief. What I want to look at now is the idea that existentialism is a holistic approach. One of the hallmarks of existentialism is that it doesn't focus just on one narrow area of human experience. It's about human experience broadly defined. And in a sense, that's why it's called existentialism. It's a philosophy of existence. What does it mean to exist? What is the nature of human reality? And what existentialism has taught us is that um, it's best to see this in holistic terms, to see the big picture. And so what it boils down to is that human experience occurs at biopsychosocial and spiritual levels. So there's another jargonistic mouthful for us to wrestle with. But actually, it's a helpful way of looking at it if we break that down into its component parts. Bio, psycho, social and spiritual. So that's biology, psychology, sociology and spirituality. Let's have a look at each of those in turn. First of all, biology. Now, what I want to emphasize here from an existentialist point of view is that biology is the vehicle, not the driver. What do I mean by that? Well, for a long time, there's been a tendency to adopt what's known as biological reductionism. And what that means is reducing the complex, multidimensional, multi-layered nature of human experience to just one dimension, just one layer, the biological. It's captured in the phrase, biology is destiny. And of course, that's been challenged by many groups, not least the feminist movement, the idea that biology is not destiny, that we live our lives through our biology. Um, we can't escape that. We are biological creatures. So th that's what I mean by biology is the vehicle for human existence, but it's not the driver. The biology doesn't tell us which way to turn. It doesn't tell us which route to follow. Although there has been a great deal written and talked about over the decades, if not over the centuries, which tends to present biology in this reductionist, deterministic way, as if biology determines our life for us, rather than just being one element amongst many. 
So it's important to recognize, yes, there is a biological dimension. Of course there is. There's a biological dimension to everything human beings are involved with because we are biological creatures. But we're not just biological creatures. Biology may well be the vehicle through which we live our lives, but it's not the driver. It's not in the driving seat. That would be a simplistic um, way of looking at human experience. So that's what I want to say about biology. Yes, it's important, but let's not overextend its importance and think that it's the only thing that's important and therefore rule out the other elements. Now, one of those other elements is psychology. Um, that um, our biological base, if you like, is, as we've already seen, quite important. We'd be lost without it. But how we live that life is partly psychological. It's partly about um, how we think about the world, how um, we feel about the world, how we behave in that world. And I just want to look at a couple of existentialist um, concepts here in terms of psychology to help give a an, an existentialist perspective on the psychological elements of traumatic grief. And the first thing I want to look at is the idea of ontological security. Now we've seen that ontology is the study of being, so ontological security means security about our very existence. So it's not just about whether we feel secure or insecure about whether we might be attacked if we go to a particular place late at night. It's not about financial security or specific elements of security like that. What ontological security refers to is our security, how comfortable we feel, if you like, how safe we feel with ourselves uh, in our very existence. And what we find, of course, is that there are different levels of ontological security. That some people feel very comfortable in their own skin, as it were. They have a strong sense of ontological security, while other people may struggle with that. Other people may struggle to have that sense of feeling comfortable with who they are and how they fit into the wider world, as it were. For example, one theory of schizophrenia is that a key part of schizophrenia is difficulty in establishing ontological security, difficulty in establishing a coherent sense of who you are and what the world means to you in a, in a sense. Now, what can happen in terms of traumatic experiences is that our ontological security can be lost. We can lose our sense of who we are. This is often referred to as, bio sorry, as biographical disruption. We temporarily, at least, just don't have a sense of who we are anymore. And, and hopefully you can see how that fits in with what I was saying before about the um, progressive regressive method we've lost that sense of time frame of where we've come from and where we're going uh, everything just seems confused and we've lost sight of um, who we are and what our life means to us now that then links into the second point which is around frameworks of meaning rooted in our perceptions so a key part of psychology from an existentialist point of view is recognizing that as we interact with the world, as we interact with other people, as we interact with the challenges of our lives, we do so by using certain perceptions. And those perceptions will be influenced by cultural lenses and by discourses, as we saw before, and indeed by wider frameworks and structures of power and so on. So we don't exist in a vacuum. Um, that's the psychological bit is recognizing that from an existentialist point of view, our um, frameworks of meaning, our perceptions will have a large degree of influence on how we make sense of situations and how we respond to them. And what can happen in the event of a traumatic experience is that our perceptions, our frameworks of meaning seem to crumble, that the world just doesn't seem the same anymore. It doesn't seem to mean what it meant before. 
And of course, that then links in with the ontological security. So clearly, from a psychological point of view, existentialism's got a lot to say about the, the psychological aspects of traumatic grief. Then there's also sociology. What we have to recognise, and existentialism is very clear about this, or at least some versions of existentialism are very clear about this, is that our lives are lived not just at a biological level and a psychological level, but also within a sociological context. And if we don't pay attention to that sociological context, we get a very distorted and limited understanding of people of human existence. So I want to focus on uh, three aspects of sociology. The first one is culture that we've already talked a little bit about. And what that's about is recognising that how people react to a traumatic experience will partly be shaped by the cultural context that they are in. And that may be, linking it into the progressive-regressive method again, it may be a culture that they've been brought up in, it may be the culture that they're in now, or it may be a culture that they aspire to. And all three of those can have a strong bearing on how the traumatic experience is understood, how we make sense of it, how we respond to it, how we cope with it, and so on. So it would be a big mistake to exclude the cultural dimension from our understanding of trauma. And that takes me back to the point I made earlier about the dangers of a, a narrow, purely biological medical model of trauma, that it doesn't take account of the significance of cult cultural factors, which can at times make a huge difference to how situations are understood and how they're dealt with. Now, what's also important to recognise is that everything that happens at a cultural level is then embedded within the wider structure of society. And what I mean by that is societies are not level playing fields. There will be um, hierarchies of power, for example. There will be differences between how certain groups, certain categories of people are defined and treated in society. So I'm talking about social divisions like class, race, gender, and so on, which will have significant implications for how traumatic experiences occur, how they're interpreted, how they're managed, and so on. And so again, if we don't pay attention to structural factors like gender, for example, then we're getting a far from complete picture of what it's all about. We are getting a very limited, narrow, distorted picture of the human experience of traumatic grief. That links in then with this idea of power. And power, it has to be recognised, can be a positive force or it can be a negative force. It can be an enabling facilitating force or it can be used to restrict people it can be used to oppress people it can be used in a number of ways which can be either positive or negative now the reason i'm uh, emphasizing this is that part of the sociological perspective on traumatic grief that fits in well with existentialism is the recognition of the flux and fluidity that there are power dynamics going on all the time and that may be between individuals who've had an, a traumatic experience and their wider family or between those individuals and helping professionals, um, social workers, therapists, doctors, nurses, a whole range of people who may be involved. But again, it would be naive, it would be incomplete, it would be a distortion if we don't try and understand significant issues around trauma in terms of power. And one of the things in particular I would want to emphasize there is the notion of empowerment and disempowerment. Because one of the problems associated with the medical model I mentioned before is it can unwittingly, unintentionally disempower people. Giving people a message that they're ill and in need of treatment is not an empowering message. So there's 
much, much more that could be said about this, but um, uh, clearly uh, there's, a, there's a limit of, to how much we can cover in one presentation. So I'm going to leave it at that for now and just mention the fourth and final element of this holistic biopsychosocial and spiritual approach, which is then, of course, spirituality. And I want to look at three aspects of spirituality from an existentialist perspective. The first one is meaning, purpose and direction. Now, recognising the significance of phenomenology as an important element of existentialism, then we're already uh, recognising that meaning is a key, key part of human existence. That in a sense, an important element of existentialism is the recognition that human beings are meaning-making creatures. And that meaning has a lot to do with our sense of purpose and direction, which is back to the progressive-regressive method and looking at how the future is shaping the present, how future meanings around purpose and direction, what we want out of life, where we're going, and so on and so forth, shapes where we are now and how we make sense of our lives. And again, I suspect it doesn't need spelling out that a traumatic experience can just tear all that up, uh, that our sense of meaning, purpose and direction can just crumble at a time of significant uh, trauma. Now this then links into the idea of identity and security. Important elements of spirituality are how do I fit into the wider world? What is my place? Who am I in relation to this wider world? And how do I feel safe within that? How do I get my sense of security? Now these are also important existentialist themes. A lot of existentialist literature relates to issues about selfhood and identity and links in with the idea of flux and fluidity that we're not fixed individuals going through life that we are in a sense on that journey through life our existence is our identity we are that journey and so our sense of identity our sense of security can as i say be turned upside down by a traumatic experience so we can have significant spiritual impoverishment because of the effects of trauma on, first of all, meaning, purpose and direction, and then secondly, identity and security. But then thirdly, what I want to say a few words about is the idea of connectedness. This is an important spiritual concept, which is about how we are part of a wider picture. We're part of something bigger than ourselves. For religious people, this is where religion comes in, that spirituality is about being part of a wider faith community, part of a, something bigger than yourself in terms of religion. But it doesn't have to be a religion, um, that there are other forms of spirituality apart from religion, of course. But it's about feeling part of something important, something bigger than yourself, whether that's humanity, whether it's part of the universe in a sense in terms of the environment and, uh, and so on. There are a whole range of ways in which we can get that sense of connectedness about how we are connected with the world, how we're connected with other people and so on. And this is an important part of our spirituality. It's also an important part of existentialism, the sense that we are not isolated individuals, that we are part of this network of human existence around the world. Now, linking this in with traumatic grief, what can happen when someone has a traumatic experience and has a grief reaction to that, then they can lose that sense of connectedness. So using religion as an example, many, many people have reported losing their faith at a time of traumatic grief. But again, it's not just about religion, that people can lose their sense of being connected to the wider world. They feel disconnected. They feel alone, isolated, alienated. And that can then make the situation even worse. 
at a time when they perhaps feel the need the greatest to connect with other people is the time where they feel that's not something they can do and so this casts some important light on some aspects of traumatic grief so that's the overall picture i wanted to paint then in terms of biopsychosocial and spiritual it's a biological dimension psychological dimension sociological dimension and spiritual dimension to human existence in general and to those experiences that in involve uh, trauma in particular now to move on now what i want to look at is some ideas around existential trauma so let's start with the word trauma itself trauma it comes from the greek word for a wound and it can be used in a physical sense you know when somebody has an accident and they have a head trauma for example but in this psychological or psychosocial or biopsychosocial and spiritual sense that i'm using it here trauma is a wound to the person but let's ask what is wounded what is it that is actually wounded when we're talking about a person experiencing a traumatic reaction a traumatic loss well what's important to recognize is that this is where our, our holistic model comes in because there may be biological elements of what is lost people can lose their appetite for example um, uh, people can lose the strength of their immune system at such times when they are vulnerable uh, the psychology can be wounded in the sense of our sense of security can be lost our sense of meaning can be lost there will be sociological aspects to this that we can lose um, our sense of being part of a wider community we can lose our sense of being part of a world which which then of course links into the spiritual elements that there can be this spiritual impoverishment as a result of trauma so what can be wounded basically is the whole person in terms of those four different elements what can also be part of this is what can be lost in particular underpinning these different aspects is meaning purpose and direction so people who've had a traumatic experience can feel all at sea in a sense they've lost their compass they've lost their bearings they don't know where they're going they don't know where they've come from life just doesn't seem to be all that meaningful anymore and i hope you can see that that fits very well within the existentialist um, uh, framework with this emphasis on perception meaning flux and fluidity the different temporal elements and uh, so on but then there's also to pin it down more specifically again issues in terms of identity and security i've already mentioned the idea of biological disruption we can lose ontological security so we've not just lost our compass we've lost our anchor as well what roots us if you like what anchors us in our ontological security can be lost we can have that biological disruption we don't know who we are anymore or it can go beyond biological disruption to what i would call biological collapse it's just as if our whole identity has fallen to pieces around us because of that traumatic loss now what can also be lost is the connectedness that we've talked about there can be a sense of alienation and abandonment uh, there can be this sense that we just don't fit in anywhere and that the world doesn't care about us that there can be this sense of how can life be so unfair to have inflicted so much harm so much suffering so this sense of connectedness can be lost or at least wounded it can be significantly harmed as a result of a traumatic experience so overall then quite a few things that can be 
wounded that can be harmed uh, through an existential trauma, through a significant traumatic grief reaction. What I want to do now is to um, outline some of the implications of this and in particular I want to come back to this critique of a medical model of trauma. So one of the major implications of uh, a, an existentialist perspective on traumatic grief is the dangers of medicalization. We can have a narrow focus on biological and psychological factors, but little or nothing is said about sociological and spiritual factors. So a medical approach to trauma tends to bias the emphasis onto two of the four aspects within a holistic perspective. What's also significant is the idea of the sick role of a, a medical model can unwittingly encourage a passive response. And when people are feeling perhaps hopeless and helpless because of a major trauma, then uh, they may be looking for other people to solve their problem for them. They may feel so disempowered by what's happened. And the idea of a sick role imposed through a medical definition can be then very counterproductive. But of course, it has to be recognised that's not the intention of a medical model. I am not in any way attacking the, the ethics or the compassion of people adopting a medical model. I'm just talking about the philosophical implications of doing so. And then last but not least in terms of the dangers of medicalization is that an existentialist perspective says that what we really need at the time of traumatic grief is human connection, not treatment. We need to be connecting with people in meaningful, supportive, empowering ways, not receiving some sort of treatment as if the problem, the pathology lies within us rather than that we are part of a much wider holistic picture that needs to be addressed. Now, one other implication of an existentialist perspective I want to explore is the idea of existential transformation. And what that refers to is, if we're not fixed entities, if we are not people with fixed personalities that can't change, if we are, as I said, people who are that journey, we're not fixed entities on a journey through life, our life is that journey, then that journey can change. That journey can be blocked, it can be hijacked, it can be sidetracked, and that's often what trauma does. But also what can happen because of this existentialist model of the person, of uh, human experience, there can be transformations that take place at certain times. Let's consider some aspects of this now. First of all, what we can have is the what's now a fairly well-established idea, the idea of post-traumatic growth. That although a traumatic experience can be devastating, it can be excruciatingly painful, it can be just so full of suffering, it can be exhausting, it can be incredibly difficult to deal with, it can still produce a positive outcome, that people can grow, learn, develop, change their lives in a positive direction. So that's something that we have to bear in mind, that that can be part of this idea of an existential transformation. Now linked to that is the idea of transformational grief, the idea that you don't have to have a trauma to be able to have that sort of um, uh, transformation that sort of existential um, reinvention of yourself in a sense, that that can come from grief as well. So where we're putting together trauma and grief, we've got a very powerful message there about the possibility of post-traumatic growth or transformational grief. That is grief that changes us in some way. Grief that has the potential to, in a sense, help us grow, make us possibly better people for the experience. And again, it may be intensely difficult, intensely painful, exhausting, incredibly difficult to deal with grief, but the net result can possibly be a positive 
transformation. Now, both of these have a lot in common with the idea of an existential awakening. And this is a concept drawn from much of the existentialist literature. And what it refers to is that we have the opportunity at times in our life to make choices that can have significant implications for the rest of our lives. That what can happen is that we can find ourselves being able to take a different path. Now, often what will happen is people are not aware of this. People feel that that path is laid out before them. They may feel, for example, that they have a fixed personality. They can't change. They can't do anything differently. And what they're doing in that sense, from an existentialist point of view, is they're disempowering themselves. It's a very strong process of self-disempowerment to say, I can't, that's not me, that's not the way I work, that's not possible for me. And what can happen is at certain times in our lives, we can experience this idea of an existential awakening where we perhaps suddenly realize, I can do it differently. I can take different options. I don't have to do things the way I've been doing them so far in my life. And so what that's about is recognizing that we can sort of awaken from this self-disempowerment and start empowering ourselves, moving in that positive direction. Now, there are a whole range of things that can trigger that existential awakening. But of course, we have to include amongst them the idea of a traumatic loss, that it can trigger an existential awakening. And in a sense, we can perhaps see both post-traumatic growth and transformational grief as examples of an existential awakening. Now, another important existentialist concept I want to mention here is the idea of authenticity. And authenticity is about being true to yourself in a way, but not being true to this fixed self that you have, because, of course, existentialism doesn't um, um, accept that we do have a fixed self. Existentialism is about this journey, the flux, the fluidity, moving through life, responding to its challenges. And authenticity is about recognising that. It's about being true to that flux and fluidity and recognising that change is possible. In fact, more than possible, but recognising that change is happening all the time. And it's about recognising uh, the importance of making choices, making decisions about what direction we want those changes in our life to go to go to go in, recognizing, of course, that we don't have complete control. But an important part of existentialism is precisely that recognition. No one has complete control, but then no one has no control either. And authenticity is about recognizing that and then about empowering ourselves to move forward. And of course, a traumatic experience will then be a challenge, if you like, to that authenticity. How somebody responds to uh, an existential uh, challenge in the form of traumatic grief will owe much to the extent of their authenticity, the extent to which they recognize that although no one has complete power, nobody has complete control, nobody has no control either. So it's about seizing those opportunities. And this links in then with the idea of existential awakening, because if people are in that existential slumber of thinking there's nothing they can do, they're disempowering themselves, then there's no authenticity in that. But once we have that recognition, once, once there's authenticity, it puts people in a much stronger position to rise to the challenges involved in traumatic grief. And then last but not least, one other um, point I want to emphasize in terms of the implications is the idea of opening doors. This concept, in a sense, sums up much of what I've been saying under this heading of existential transformation. Now, post-traumatic growth, transformational grief, existential awakening, authenticity, what they all have in common is the idea of opening doors, that it creates opportunities for us. 
Now, of course, we have to handle this very sensitively. Saying to somebody who has just gone through a traumatic loss that this opens doors for you is not likely to be well received. But nor should we lose sight of the opportunities that traumatic grief offers both to the individuals concerned and to our role in trying to understand and be helpful in response to traumatic grief situations. So that brings me to the end then of my um, presentation to this overview of how an existentialist perspective can cast light on traumatic grief. What I hope you've got from this is the recognition that while traumatic grief is extremely challenging, extremely difficult, existentialism doesn't offer us any simple, straightforward solutions. But what it does do is, first of all, recognise the complexities of what we're dealing with in terms of traumatic grief. And secondly, what it does is gives us a sophisticated, holistic framework that helps us to make sense of the complexities and then provides us with a basis of understanding that we can use in responding to those challenges. So thank you for your time and attention. I really do hope you found it useful. Thank you.